Yeah, let's talk about money. So we're, we're in a series of sermons, and forgive me, I'm still getting my voice back from this silly cold from two weeks ago. But we're, we're Sunday to Sunday talking about things that just aren't often talked about in the church, at least not in a healthy way. This is another one of those topics that some churches do talk about, but again, not in a way that's always helpful or healthy. Usually it's one of two extremes. We're guilt tripping people to give more money, or we're telling them how to financially invest their money and be good stewards. But we barely ever just talk about money, what it is and why it's so important to us. And that's what I want to do. I've heard my whole life, put your money where your mouth is, or money talks, or cash is king, which isn't true uh, because, well, that's another story for another time. Anyway, I, I was thinking this week, what people do for money. Now think in your life experience, just in your own life experience, what people have done for more money. Almost anything. Ironically, very few people are ever taught about money. Even fewer are taught godly principles about their money. Do we realize, for example, that most of the world lives in poverty, extreme poverty? I don't think we consider that very often. We're too busy worrying about how we're going to make more money to maintain a middle-class lifestyle in a world where most people are impoverished and hungry every day. Some of those poor nations throughout the world have statistically the happiest people. Some of the wealthiest nations in the world have the most people on antidepressants. And not just because they can afford them, it's because they need them. Because money doesn't solve your problems. How much money you have has never been the answer, never. So we have to think about money. Now if you wanted a Dave Ramsey sermon today, that's not what you're gonna get. I'm not against Dave Ramsey, I don't, I don't use his, his stuff, but I know people who do. I think to manage money, this is gonna sound pretentious, but I think you just need a little self-control and common sense, to be really blunt. Uh, it's just most people lack those two things. So if you wanna talk about money sometime privately, we can. We could talk about self-control and common sense. And then beyond that, we could have good conversations about investments. But instead of financial tips, which I'm perhaps not qualified to give you and I really don't want to, I want to talk about what the Bible says about money, because I think it's more important, and I think it's what we don't talk about enough. Money, to start out with, isn't just money, at least not in Scripture. When Jesus says money, he uses an Aramaic word, mammon. Anybody know what that word means? It means possessions or belongings. It means stuff. We want it to just mean money, cash money, but it doesn't. It means all the stuff that cash can buy you. It's the material world. So if we want to group that in with money, I think that would help us. So we're not just talking about actual money in a bank account. We're talking about stuff. We're talking about material possessions. Because that's why we want money, is to buy stuff. To travel, to see the world, to make memories. And none of that's inherently wrong. And yet Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, famous words, No one can serve, do you know it? Two masters. No one. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to this one and despise the other one. But you can't serve two masters. You, you can't serve both God and, and then he uses the word mammon. You can't serve God and stuff. Amen. You can't love both. You can't love both. Money is not God. It isn't a God. It provides no lasting security. Money has no concern for your welfare. The stuff that you own doesn't care about you. You know that. Don't you? You know all the things that you possess have no feeling, no emotion, no concern for you, can do nothing for you, cannot transform your heart. That's why wealthy people are no more satisfied or happy than impoverished people. In fact, it's the opposite that's often the case because there's a difference between the buying power to live lavishly and the divine power to live well. That sounded smart. I'm going to say it again. There's a difference between the buying power to live lavishly and the divine power to live well. And those don't always match up. Money can't save you. Jesus also said, Matthew 19, 24, it's easier for a camel, you know this one too, don't you, to go through the eye of a needle. A camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's not some hopeless prognosis for the wealthy. It's a hyperbole. It's exaggeration. Jesus did it a lot. He used wordplay. He exaggerated things to make a point. What do you think the point is? It's that even the rich can't buy their way into God's kingdom. 
He didn't mean only the poor can get in. He meant no matter how rich you are, that will not guarantee you entry. Your money has no power in the world to come. The things you own here don't go with you when you're gone. Now, we've all heard that. There is no U-Haul behind a hearse. We've heard those things, right? We know you can't take it with you when you go. Or as you came into the world, so you will leave the world. You came in as a, a little baby with nothing, you'll leave the world as an old person with nothing, God willing. But you can't take the stuff. The stuff stays. And worse than that, it, it gets rusty and falls apart. It deteriorates. Money is important, but it's not God. It has no power Certainly not power in the world to come. So let me ask you a few questions without you getting offended. I just want you to think, honestly, you don't need to answer out loud or raise your hands, but think about your own financial situation. Would you say that you are well off currently? Or perhaps you'd say you're struggling. Do you feel rich? Are you broke? Do you live paycheck to paycheck? Do you feel underpaid? undervalued by your employer. Maybe you're unemployed, making more than you deserve, and you feel guilty. That's one we never talk about, but there's plenty of people who know they make more than they deserve, and they feel guilty about it all the time, and they just have to pretend they don't. Maybe you're living generously, taking care of those in need. Maybe you're buried under debt. It's hard to talk about this stuff. Even those questions made some of you cringe. Some of you were squirming as I asked those questions. Others of you were falling asleep. That's fine. It's hard to discuss money. It's hard enough to discuss money with family and friends, let alone a room of 200 people that are, for the most part, strangers to you, or at least not, not really close family and friends. You don't talk about money in a place like this. And we all know someone who has quit church because of the way religious people handle money. I call it the holy hustle. That sounds like a TikTok dance. Uh, we got to get on that. So one of you teenagers help me with that after church. Uh, sanctified swindlers, okay? You have, there's fun words for it. Uh, you can call them whatever you want, but, but we know what they are. They're charlatans. They're people who rip off those who are oftentimes already needy, and they take the little they have and fatten themselves up. And they do this in the name of religion or God. We see that. We know that's out there. That's real. And it tarnishes the reputation of all churches. But I do think, even, even though I think we could be better stewards always, I think this is a pretty good church. This is a healthy church where we try to steward things well and, and be generous at all times. And even at a church like this that's doing a pretty good job with money, it's still weird to talk about money. It's still uncomfortable to bring it up in large groups like this. It'd probably be just as awkward to bring it up in a small group. It's complicated. We can't, we can't pretend that on a Sunday morning there aren't people in this room who drove here in a six-figure SUV and people who had to bum a ride to get here, sitting in the same pews together. You can't pretend that's not happening. That's real life. Money is complicated. And I don't say that to make anyone uncomfortable. It's just facts. It's the world. What's worse, we let our, our current financial position dictate our attitude or define our value. We often, because it's culturally entrenched, we think that how much we have tells people how much we're worth. We define ourselves by our income and our stuff. We play the caste system game, rich versus poor. Jesus said there will always be the poor among you. What he meant was, people will always do this. They'll always hoard and gather for themselves and leave others without because everybody wants more. Now, today in America, it's more nuanced than that. Our caste system is, is multi-layered with a whole middle class, at least it used to be, is disappearing. Eh, conversation for another time. But this is the same game humans have always played. Wealth equals status. Status equals power. Power equals independence. Independence equals free agency. Agency means I choose what I want that will make me happy. And then happiness, of course, is the goal. So all the way back to the beginning, wealth, by way of all those other moving pieces, equals happiness. Wealth equals happiness. That's the game that we play. It's not 
It's not true. It's rigged. But people fall for it, and they keep running in that rat race every day of their lives, thinking that more money will give them less problems. They obviously didn't listen to Biggie. Some of you know Biggie Smalls, and you're afraid to laugh because you're in church. That's fine. We know, we know it doesn't work that way, that wealth does not equal happiness. But we believe the lie. We know it's not true, and we still buy into it, pun intended. It's, it's rigged. It's rigged. So, this is a part I didn't want to tell you, but it's true. As a preacher, I have to admit, even the Bible seems confused about money maybe even contradictory. I'm going to read from two different psalms. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. His delight is in the law of the Lord. On his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water. It yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so. They're like chaff that the wind drives away. The blessed, prosperous man is the one who honors the law of God. Or, or blessed, prosperous woman, either way. But the person who is blessed and prosperous is the person who obeys God. It's right there in black and white in the Bible. It's right there in your Bible. And then we flip the pages to Psalm 73. The wicked, the ones, the chaff or the ones that like chaff are blown away by the wind. This is what we read just 72 Psalms later. I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. What? They have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They're not in trouble like other people. They're not stricken like the rest of humanity. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongue struts through the earth. You're supposed to picture this cocky, braggadocious person. That's the wicked person. Prosperous until the day they're laid to rest. The rich get richer. Which is it? Which one's true? Is it the law keeper who is prosperous and blessed? Or is it the wicked man who seems to get away with it? That's frustrating, isn't it? And maybe that's why we don't talk a lot about it in church. Because we all know nasty people who are blessed with much. And we all know wonderful people who struggle every day. Why? Phillips Brooks, in the late 1800s, he was the rector of Boston's Trinity Chapel, big, famous church. But you know him as the author of O Little Town of Bethlehem. You know that song, right? Christmas hymn. He wrote that. He also wrote in a sermon, show me a poor man and I'll show you a worthless sinner. But Jesus said in a sermon, blessed are the poor. Which is it? You remember Solomon in the Hebrew Bible, King Solomon? He asked for wisdom to govern well. And God said, because of your request, I'll also give you great wealth. And we think he was blessed when, in fact, he seemed to have been cursed with everything he ever wanted. That's not a blessing. Solomon's riches were his ruin. At least they were the path to his ruin. Vanity of vanities. Assuming King Solomon is Koheleth, the teacher who writes Ecclesiastes. He says, I know what it's like to have all kinds of stuff. And it's a joke. It's just one big joke. Vapor in the wind. Empty. Nothing. The Apostle Paul reminds us that money's complicated. 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. Paul says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It's through this craving some have wandered away from the faith. They've pierced themselves with many pangs. That's the inspiration for that OJ song that I walked up to. Money, 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 money. They wrote that based on 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. 
they quote it in the song. It's the love of money that is the root of so much evil. That song's been sampled by artists throughout the years. And then, of course, Money by Pink Floyd on the 1973 Dark Side of the Moon album. And that's been sampled in, I think, every movie I've ever seen. Uh, Biggie said, Mo Money, Mo, money, Mo Problems. Uh, there's probably some other ones that I'm not thinking of. All kinds of songs, famous, some of the most famous songs about money, about greed and envy, about materialism. It's not because those songs just really sell. It's because we all deal with it, because we live in a world where money is important and complicated. People, they'll gamble away their livelihood at a, a chance to have more money. They'll take advantage of others, rob from their own family and friends, sell their body, risk prison time, cheat on taxes and embezzle money through companies. They'll forfeit their own souls just to have a little more, just to have a little more stuff. We love money. And it's just paper with dead people's faces on it. So we know it's not the money that we love. It's just paper, right? It's what the money buys for us. We think wealth equals happiness. We believe the lie. And we think if we had enough money, we would be happy. Why do you really want more money? I mean, deep down, why is it that we believe more money would bring us more happiness? We think money will satisfy. So I want to look at a story in Scripture. Uh, you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to recite the story from memory uh, and tell you the details. And then we're going to read from Haggai in a moment. But this is in 2 Kings chapter 5. It's one of my favorite stories. And it involves the prophet Elisha and a guy named Naaman. So Naaman is uh, commander-in-chief of the Syrian army. The Syrians are an enemy to the Israelites. But in this moment, they're not in, in battle with one another. And Naaman, who's beloved by his king and his people, develops leprosy. Not the quarantine kind that you have to be in your own community, just, just a skin disorder that was called leprosy. There were different forms of leprosy. Anyway, he has some kind of leprosy. He can still live with other people, but he's not functioning at full capacity. He's sick. And his servant girl that they picked up along the way, who was a Hebrew woman, she sees what's happening to her boss. She really likes Naaman. He's a likable guy, and he's an effective commander of the army. Even the king loves him. And she says, my lord Naaman, I know someone who could help you you need to go to Israel and speak to the prophet of God. So Naaman, excited about this opportunity, tells the king of Syria. The king of Syria sends a letter from his excellency to his excellency, king to king. And the king in Israel gets the letter, and he's upset. He tears his clothes. He says, is this some kind of joke? I don't know how to heal people. And Elisha, the prophet, finds out about it. And he says to the king of Israel, tell Naaman to come to my house, and I'll help him. So now Elisha, the prophet of Yahweh, the prophet of God, is going to help the commander of an enemy's army, the Syrian army, named Naaman. So Naaman goes to Elisha's house. He brings a caravan of wagons full of stuff, silver, gold, horses, chariots, all the fine arraignment of, of a wealthy man. And he shows up at the little cottage of Elisha, and Elisha sends out his servant, Gehazi. Say Gehazi. Very good. Gehazi. So he sends out Gehazi, his servant. And he says, I want you to go tell Naaman, all he has to do is travel to the Jordan River and wash himself seven times in the river. He will be healed of his leprosy. Naaman is indignant. He's mad, first of all, that, that this man, Elisha, didn't come out himself. He sent a servant. He didn't even come outside to meet him in, in person. So that's, you know, a little bit disrespectful in Naaman's eyes. But secondly, the request is obnoxious. Naaman says, there are better rivers in my homeland, why would I go to the little dirty Jordan River here to get well? We have much better, cleaner water where I'm from. So he starts to leave in anger. Then Naaman's servant, a different servant, says to him, uh, my Lord, if he had asked you to do some complicated thing to be healed, wouldn't you have done it? He said, yeah, of course I would have. So then he looked at me and said, well, then why wouldn't you do a simple thing like go to a river and dip seven times in the water? And so Naaman gets a level head, he loses his ego a bit, and he says, okay, I guess you're right, I'm going to go for it, I'm going to try it. And lo and behold, it works. He dips seventh time in the river, and he's healed of his leprosy. And he's celebrating, and he's praising God, and he comes back to Elisha's home, and he says, let me pay you. This is amazing. 
Let me pay you. What can I give you? And Elisha says, this isn't about money. It's never about money in the kingdom of God. You don't pay for the blessing. You don't pay for healing. You can't buy the love of God. I don't want your money. Take it with you and go. And Naaman says, no, 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 you've got to let me pay you. It feels wrong. I owe you something. And Elisha says, no, truly, it's not about money. Just praise God and move on. So Naaman packs up and he leaves with all his riches. And Gehazi sees all this stuff. And he can't help himself. He, he chases Naaman down and he says, hey, hey, hey. A couple of guys just showed up from out of town. They're going to have to spend the night. They don't have any clothes. Could you give us some money, some changes of clothes? That would really help. And Naaman says, of course, I've been waiting to give some, something to you. Let me pay you. You want a talent of silver? Take two talents, two bags of silver. Take, take a couple changes of clothes. It's so much stuff, you can't carry it home. I'm going to send my servants with you to carry the stuff. And Gehazi says, okay, okay, per perfect. This is, this is just what I wanted. No questions asked. Here's the stuff. Here's more than what you wanted. Take it and go and be with God. And so Gehazi, in his excitement, hurries home. He hides all the stuff at his house, and he goes in to see Elisha. And Elisha says, hey, where you been, buddy? And Gehazi says, oh, I didn't go anywhere. And Elisha says, my spirit went with you. I know exactly where you were. Look at your hands. And he looks down and he has the leprosy of Naaman. Gehazi is now a leper. And Elisha says, it wasn't about the money. What have you done? It's a weird story, isn't it? I think that's why I like it. I'm a weird guy. It's a weird story. Gehazi... Part of what makes it weird is he seems like a good guy. I mean, it's easy to paint a villain in scripture, isn't it? Every cheap piece of art ever made shows Judas hunched over with a unibrow in the dark corner, right? He's always this generic villain, but we know that's not what it would have been like. Judas would have been just as handsome as John. That's cheap. That's fake. It doesn't work like that. Here's Gehazi. He's just a regular old guy. He's a nice guy. He's got a family. Elisha refers to his future descendants suffering, so he must have had children. That means he has a wife and kids at home that are likely depending on him to put food on the table, to pay the bills. And he doesn't make a lot of money. He's the prophet's servant. In the military, he'd be an assistant to a chaplain. He's like a second-hand man to a servant, a servant of a servant. That's not the kind of job you go brag about at a high school reunion. Like, well, what do you do now? Oh, I, I'm a servant to a servant. I'm sure his parents weren't proud of that. How are you going to provide for your family, son? What are you going to tell people? This isn't something to, to be proud of. But he pursues this life. I guess it's because he loves God. I think Gehazi loves God. I think he loves Elisha. I think he wants to be a servant of God. He's been following this guy around for years, faithful as a disciple to Elisha. Scripture doesn't tell us, doesn't tell us why he does it. So as we often are doing in Scripture, we're guessing and God does that on purpose, so we have to think critically about what the Bible says. Here's this poor man, years of hard labor as a servant to a servant, barely making ends meet. And then this guy pulls up with chariots full of gold and silver and finery. Who wouldn't fall prey to that? If somebody pulls up some fancy car, bags of money, falling out of the windows and says, don't you want some money? Take some money. And your boss says, no, we don't want your money, bye. And then they leave. Aren't you going to sneak away and try to get some of that money? I mean, he's not a villain. He's not a bad guy. He's just a guy. He's just a poor guy. So we have to guess what, what was it. Maybe, maybe it just got the best of him in the moment. It happens to everybody. It's not like I premeditate before I sin most of the time. I don't sit around and think, how am I going to sin this week? Uh, it just, it just kind of happens. Like It's in the heat of a moment, and you do the thing or you say the thing, and then instantly you're like, what was I thinking how did that come out of my mouth? What, what, what possessed me to say that or to do that? That's how it happens. It's just in a moment. Then cut him some slack. He's just a, a man. He's a human. And in the moment, he gets caught up. His feelings get the best of him. He doesn't weigh the consequences. It happens. And we can be so creative when that happens to justify our sin. Here is, of course, the sin of greed. He had to have more stuff. Here's stuff for free. You can have it, and he has to have it. That's greed. But we can justify that. Perhaps 
you explain it away by saying he deserved more. Perhaps he thought that. Gehazi probably thought, I deserve more than the pennies that I get paid. I serve a faithful servant of God. Every day, I carry his stuff, load around all this heavy whatever, put the firewood in, in bundles and, and help with the animals, whatever else he had to do. He had to do all the grunt work, right? He's like, I do all this heavy lifting, dirty work, and I get paid nothing. Poorer than poor. He feels undervalued. The system's unfair. We can make an excuse for that when someone's not paid appropriately and they see a chance to take a little more. Perhaps. Maybe. Maybe he just justified it because Naaman is a Syrian. He's a leader of a pagan army that has fought the Israelites. He's a bad guy. If there is a villain in the story, it would be Naaman, not Gehazi. Naaman's the villain. He's a leader of, a, of an army of a people who don't like the Israelites who at most, of, most times are fighting with the Israelites. You may not know this, but it was later a Syrian king, Antiochus Epiphanes, who committed the abomination of desolation, who slaughtered a pig in the temple in Jerusalem. That was a Syrian, a Syrian king. Here's the commander who serves under a Syrian king. Maybe he convinced himself, it's okay to take a little from the Syrians. Sock it to them, they're bad guys. They deserve it. We do that, don't we? Base our ethics on the other. It's not something in us, whether it's right or wrong. It's whether it's okay to do it to them. Do they deserve it or not? You see what I'm saying? We do that all the time. My ethics aren't defined by my values. They're defined by you, the other. Do you deserve this? I would never, ever snatch a purse from an elderly woman on the sidewalk. But I might steal a little extra from the insurance claim or from the government I'm not saying I've done that. My insurance agent is in this room, so I should be careful. <laughs> but, you, but you know what I mean, don't you? When you think of a big conglomerate, some massive company, it seems okay to slip a little away. They're not going to miss it. Even worse if they're villains like the IRS. You know, who wouldn't want to steal from the government? They deserve it. They steal from us every year. It's our turn. Perhaps that's what it was. It's, well, it's a Syrian. It's okay to take a little. But we know that's wrong. We know that's wrong. Gehazi knew it was wrong. It's in the covenant language. Treat the stranger and the foreigner as if they're a member of your own family. Take them into your home. Feed them, clothe them, shelter them, and keep them safe as if they are your own blood. That's right there in the law of Moses. You can't mistreat him because he's a Syrian. And of course, Jesus would add insult to injury and say, you don't just take care of them, you love them as you love yourselves. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. We know that it's wrong, but we still do it. Perhaps Gehazi just realized that he would never see Naaman again. This one may seem subtle, but this is what gets me a lot. Gets me in trouble, I mean. The thought that nobody will see it. Don't pretend you haven't thought that. In a moment of weakness, nobody will know, nobody will see. Naaman will leave, go back to Syria, and never be heard from again. What's it going to hurt? That's why people say, I just can't face them. Whoever this person is that's, that has some wrong, some tension. I just, I don't want to be with them in person. I can't see their face. Well, what do they mean? They mean to see them is different than just to think about seeing them. It's the physical seeing them that makes a difference. I don't know why, but it's true, out of sight, out of mind. It's true. Not seeing can help. It's easy to do the wrong thing when we know no one is watching. Perhaps Gehazi decided the amount was small enough to be acceptable. We do that sometimes too. We can breach our ethics based on how much is involved. So, you know, maybe it's because he's a Syrian, but maybe, maybe it's because it's two talents of silver and a change of clothes. It's not that big a deal. This guy's loaded. What's well, a little bit? take a little bit. We do that a lot. I think it's the opposite that's probably true, though. That we think by taking just a little, we don't, we don't prove to be bad people. But maybe it's those who take just a little who are the worst kind of people. It's just the little stuff. Just take little things here and there. Steal a pack of gum. Stupid stuff. And we think, well, I'm not a bad person. It's just a little thing. I'm using those examples because those won't hurt your feelings. But your little things, you know what they are. But they're just little things. What's it going to hurt? I had a professor, may he rest in peace, uh, his name is Doc Reese. 
He was a Hebrew professor in college. And he used to tell us on our exam days not to cheat on one of his exams because if you're going to breach your ethical conscience, go rob a bank. Do something that matters. Don't cheat on this exam. It's not worth it. And of course, we all laughed and we knew what he meant because what he meant was you're going to breach your conscience either way. Don't waste that. If you're going to do the wrong thing, make sure it's worth it. What he was really teaching us was ethics itself, that no matter the size of the wrong, it's still wrong. And in fact, the smaller the wrong, the stupider it is. What a dumb thing. What a dumb thing to cheat on a test for one portion of one grade for one class that you'll never remember five years later. What a stupid thing. But people will do it every day of the week. Steal a little here and there from their work. Just so many examples of little, little things that are actually a revelation of the soul. Perhaps Gehazi just realized, as simple as this, he had a chance to take something. And when you live in a cruel and unfair world where the, the scales are always tipped to advantage the wrong people, then it seems right to just take what you can when you can. When the chance comes along, you take it. You seize the moment. Carpe diem. Some people live that way. They just take when they get the chance to take. There's an elderly woman in East Tennessee where I pastored before we moved here, and they had a lottery drawing for free groceries at the local grocery store. And she was so excited. And so uh, we, we waited until it was announced, and of course it wasn't her ticket number. And, and I'll never forget what she said. Because the person who won seemed like a you know, wealthy, upper-class person, probably owned rental properties in Gatlinburg and had plenty of money, and she's dressed to go play tennis at the country club. And she wins the free groceries. And here's this elderly, widowed woman who needed those groceries. And she just looks at the dirt and she said, them who has, gets. Them who has, gets. And I'll never forget that, partly because it's a weird statement. Like, I had to think about what she said, because I'm not from East Tennessee. I'm a, I'm a city boy. It's like, them, them who has gets. Oh, I see what she's saying. The ones who already have just keep getting more. And the ones who don't seem to ever have anything just keep on not having anything. That's true, isn't it? That's painfully true. It's like the people who already prosper just keep prospering. And oftentimes, they are wicked, fat, and sleek, eyes bulging out, like Psalm 73 would say. Money is complicated. You see what I'm saying? That's why we don't talk about it. I'll tell you where to invest it or how to save it better or how to divide it into envelopes and pay all your bills on time. We can talk about that. I could tell you to give more to the church, promise you tenfold blessing. You could just write checks to me and a hundredfold blessing. Uh, that's a joke. It's a joke. But to just talk about money and stuff, that's a lot more painful because it is complicated. Because it digs into our, our psyche because the way we use money says so much about us. That's why the Bible talks about it a lot, like a lot. I've heard people say Jesus talked more about hell than anything else in the Bible, uh, which is also completely false. He talked about it three times, and all three times it was a metaphor from real life. That's a sermon for another week. What he did talk about a lot was money. And so did the Old Covenant. A lot of rules about money. Because money is important. And money is complicated. I don't know what his reason was. Gehazi takes the gold, or the silver. He takes the two talents of silver. He takes the clothes. He lets the servants carry it to his house. And then what happens next is tragic. Because greed doesn't end with more money. It never does. Inevitably, our greed will always lead to damage upon the soul. To broken relationships. Gehazi now has leprosy, and he's lied to his boss, his friend Elisha, and he's probably had to lie to his wife and children when he comes home with all this stuff, and they say, uh, where'd this stuff come from? Hey, Daddy, where'd, the, where'd those bags of silver come from? There's no pride in that. I don't know what he would have said, but this has damaged his life, the stuff that he was so excited to have. The only thing worse, I think, would be if he got away with it, if Elisha didn't catch him in a lie. I think that would have been worse because two bags of silver would never be enough. Some of you know. Some, some of you could help me preach that point. It would have been worse to not get caught because two bags of silver would never have been enough. Do you know what I mean? How much more will he need? 
Will this new wealth demand a new level of income? He's done it now. He's in the rat race. And there's no getting out. He's in the labyrinth. He's racing with every other rat to get the cheese, not knowing it's poison. He doesn't even know what he's doing. Some of you know the race never ends. There's no real winner. But once you're in, you can't really get back out. It's a fun sermon. That was sarcasm. The prophet Haggai, it's the last scripture I want to look at, Haggai chapter 1, had to address the ancient Israelites. They had forsaken God. They had forsaken the temple and its ministries. They were building up their own homes. They were spending money on themselves and their lavish lifestyles. They were excited to live licentious lives. But they forsook the temple. They weren't worshiping God. They worshiped themselves. And they forgot about the needs of the poor and the hungry and the widows and the orphans. And this is what God says to them through the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house. That is, fix the temple. That's what he means. That I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. When you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house, it lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew. The earth has withheld its produce. I've called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast and on all their labors. God says, if you want to bless yourselves instead of me, if you want to spend all your time and money on stupid things, go ahead. Play the stupid game, win stupid prizes. You're going to love it. Meanwhile, me, the one who actually feeds you and clothes you and cares for you, I'll call for drought upon the land, and we'll see how well you do on your own. That's tough. Because sometimes it's, it's us. We spend our time and energy and money on ourselves instead of God's kingdom. And I'm not just talking about putting money in offering plates. I'm talking about the way you live day to day. Where do you spend your resources, your time, your money, and your energy? Into what are you investing yourself? And to what goal, what purpose? Sometimes God has to interject and say, this is dumb. You're being dumb. Stop it. He blows it away. God would rather, I'm going to say this twice because I think it's really good. I highlighted repeat. So I want you to hear this. God would rather destroy the things you have built than to let you finish building them on sinking foundations. God would rather destroy the things you have built at this point in your life than to let you finish the project on sinking sand. That's mercy. And so it's God who blows it all away. I love this story in Haggai because it says the Lord blew it away. Not the devil. That's what you say when bad stuff happens. I've heard you all say it. Oh, that devil. He's always out to get me. Well, you, especially if you have some financial struggle. Oh, it's the devil trying to get me. What if it's God blowing all your stuff away? You can't believe that, can you? It's hard to accept that. That God would see the wealth we've amassed and he would blow it away. But it's God. It says it in the text. God has done this. The Lord God has blown it all away. Sometimes the greatest thing God can do to our selfish efforts is to stop us in our tracks. Sometimes that's the best thing God can do for us. Because greed destroys people. When we greedily amass more for ourselves and we live selfish lives, God may decide to blow it all away to save us. When he blows it away, it hurts. We think he's punishing us, but he's really helping us. What would happen if we woke up from the greedy stupor? If we heard God's call and we repented? What if we changed? If we stopped loving stuff so much and started to love God and love our neighbors more? Because that's the point, right? That's what Jesus said at the very beginning. You can't serve two masters. You either love God and therefore love your neighbors, or you love stuff. And that means you despise God and you despise your neighbors. He couldn't have been any clearer. You will love the one and despise the other. You can't love both. You can't worship God and collect all the stuff for yourself. 
You literally cannot. You will love one and hate the other. So what happens if we change? If we decide we're not going to love the stuff anymore, we're going to learn how to love God and love our neighbors more. Well, we go on in Haggai 1, verses 12 and 13. So then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, that is, those who were still faithful to God, There's always a remnant of people. Some of you in here, I know you are a remnant of God's people. They obeyed the voice of the Lord, their God, and the words of Haggai, the prophet, as the Lord, their God, had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. It literally means they were in awe of God. So instead of loving stuff, they began to worship God. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message, I am with you, declares the Lord. It changed like that. God says, I've called for a drought upon everything you have. And now God says, okay, I'm with you again. I'm here. Whenever we redirect, God blesses us. I don't mean we prosper. I mean we are blessed. It might mean blowing stuff away rather than getting more. But it's a blessing. When we listen to God, when we turn from sin, God is there to put the pieces back together. So, If you, like me and many others, have suffered from the love of money, anybody here suffer from it? Oh, you don't want to raise your hands. Some of you are like, then they're going to think I'm rich and they're going to ask me for money after church. (laughs) We know everybody spends the money they have. That's why everybody lives paycheck to paycheck in America. Because it doesn't matter how big your paycheck is, you spend it all. That's a sermon for another day. That's that Dave Ramsey stuff. We We don't have to get into that. I think a lot of you are lying just now because you didn't raise your hands. Let's give you an, another chance. C- close your eyes. We're going we're gonna to have a moment of confession before God. How many of you, in full transparency, have suffered from the love of money? That's more like it. Keep your eyes closed, guys. It's not too late. It's not too late. The Israelites chose to to redirect. That's what repentance means, to turn around. They changed their behavior. They learned to quit loving their stuff and learn how to love God and their neighbors. They began to use their money for the poor, the hungry, the widows, the orphans, instead of fattening themselves up for the day of slaughter. We have to make that change from greed and selfishness to generosity and loving service. And God will declare, I'm with you. That could be your story. It could be your story today if you were to make the change. Would you stand with me as we close? I do have some final questions to ask you about stuff, about money. First of all, are you content with the money and the stuff that you've accumulated? And I want you to think very carefully about these questions. Are you content with the money and the stuff you have accumulated? Can you speak about it without embarrassment or guilt? Because you've worked hard to earn a living, and you've shared with those in need. Contentment is an extraordinary gift. You can have contentment whether you're rich or poor. If you know you have worked hard and and shared with others, then you can be content. So the first question is, do you have contentment with the things that are yours? Because they're not really yours. And that leads to the second question. Do you live out of genuine gratitude for all that you have received? Whether you've received much or little, are you grateful for it? Whatever you have that you can say is yours, do you have gratitude? Kylie and I often discuss what we would want most for our children, where we're going to direct our efforts as parents. Parents do that. You have to do that. You have to decide where are we going to put our effort. You know, what do we want most for our children? I have always known at the very top of that list is the spirit of gratitude. What I gripe about more than anything in my home is that they be grateful, or when they're not, that you're being awfully ungrateful. You need to be grateful because I see it in myself, the lack of gratitude. And I see how painful life becomes when you're not a grateful person. I have never known anyone, you think about this, maybe I'm wrong, but I have never known anyone who was bitter or greedy or envious or violent or angry or mean-spirited who was at the same time grateful. Often our sin is born of ungrateful hearts. So I believe gratitude is an antidote to sin certainly the sin of greed and envy. Money, money's complicated, but gratitude is quite simple. So I think that's where we should start. In a sermon, when we talk about money, what we really should talk about is being grateful. 
god help us to be more